All right, good morning, everyone. It's a, a beautiful Sunday morning here in Durham, and uh, we have our old friend, Christian Wilson, is here with us today. He's going to be presenting to us this week on the Christian Old Testament. Okay. Thank you, Carl. <clears throat> in around 340 BC, Philip of Macedon did something that no Athenian or Spartan had done before. He had he united all of the many city-states of Greece under his leadership, one king. Didn't last long for Philip. He was assassinated in 336 BC. But then, excuse me. But then his young son took over the reins of the government. His son was twenty at the time. His son's name was Alexander. Uh, whereas Philip had the big ambition of uniting all the Greek city-states. Alexander's ambition was far greater to unite the whole world under his Three years later, in 333, he started that quest uh, with a vast army. He began to conquer the Persian Empire. By, uh, we, I don't have a map, here's your invisible map. He crosses uh, uh, Greece into what is now Turkey, rapid conquest, one battle after another, gets to, uh, conquers Jerusalem in 331 BC. 330 BC, he conquers Egypt. Uh, he will found a new city on the Mediterranean coast of Egypt. I bet somebody can tell me what the name of that city is. Alexandria. Alexandria. He will found six other cities, all of which were named Alexandria. Uh, the Persian, his Persian Empire conquest uh, then took him uh, deeper into uh, what is now the Middle East. Eventually, he got as far as the Ganges, and the legend is that on the shore of the Ganges, he wept because he had no more worlds to conquer. Soon after, on the return to Greece, he uh, got sick, infectious disease, died at age 33. Then, uh, he, well, he had no uh, of age male heir. His empire was divided among four gener his four generals, and the one that will concern us is uh, Ptolemy. Ptolemy's P-T-O-L-E-M-Y. And let's see, do, yeah. um, he, um, Ptolemy governed what would be called the Ptolemaic Kingdom, which was Egypt and the Sinai. And in uh, the early years of the Ptolemaic Kingdom, included uh, Jerusalem. In 302 BC, Ptolemy, Ptolemy I, was succeeded by his son, Ptolemy II, and uh, who had the honorific name Philadelphus. Uh, he, and he was in Alexandria, there would be, uh, whereas the other kingdoms that came from Alexander's uh, conquest changed governments fairly, uh, 
fairly often, the <clears throat> Ptolemies continued to rule Egypt for 13 generations, all the way down to uh, 31 BC. The last ruler of the Ptolemies uh, was a woman, and I bet you can tell me her name. Cleopatra. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Carmelita. Hi, Doug. Uh, and <clears throat> Ptolemy II was not so much of a warrior. He was a builder. One of the things that Ptolemy II wanted to build was a library, a big library, a library that would contain every book that had ever been written. It's a lot easier to do than three in 300 BC than it is now. He uh, all of those books uh, from many different languages to be translated into Greek. Greek, Alexander had spread the Greek language all over the Mediterranean world in the Middle East. And so uh, he began to acquire scholars uh, from distant places to translate books into Greek for his library. One of the books that he had heard about and wanted to have translated uh, into Greek for his library was the Hebrew scriptures, what we call the Old Testament. So he commissioned a group of 70, Roman numeral LXX, 70 scholars, some traditions say 72, who were all rabbis, who spoke uh, and wrote both Greek and Hebrew to make a translation of the Bible into Greek. Uh, the 70 or 72, I'll call it 72, is 72 scholars were each getting, given a copy of scrolls of the Hebrew scriptures. They all went to their homes and began translating. They translated for 72 days. And in after the 72 days, they all came back with their translations of the Hebrew Bible into Greek. And all 72 translations were identical word for word. And if you believe that story, uh, yeah, no. If you believe that story, it would be a greater miracle than anything Jesus did in the New Testament, I think. Uh, <laughs> nonetheless, the kernel of truth in the story was that the, in Alexandria, about the turn of the uh, third century BC, the Greek translation of the scriptures uh, came into being. And let's see, can I have the next slide for Nelson? There we go. Can you tell us why did a, a Greek language uh, book, if you will, document end up with Roman numerals in its title instead of Greek numbers? Uh, because scholars uh, later on, well, the Romans ruled that area later on, and scholars who first uh, be began uh, in modern times studied this, uh, put it in, they wrote in Latin and put it all in uh, Roman numerals. Yes, those are not Greek numerals. Uh, hey, buddy. Good morning. Hi, Jay. Hey. Uh, We're trying to see. Yeah, well, I'm, yeah, <laughs> all the way from Wilmington. Okay, 
So <clears throat> we now had a Greek translation uh, that could be used by uh, people who knew no Hebrew and increasingly by Jews who knew no Hebrew. Increasingly, it was the case that uh, Greek became the language of the Jews. Uh, everywhere outside of Palestine and the vast majority of uh, Jews did live outside of Palestine. By the time of Jesus, uh, there were uh, far more Jews who lived in the city of Alexandria, about two million, uh, than those who lived in all of Palestine. So, uh, and the great Jewish philosopher Philo of Alexandria couldn't read a word of Hebrew. The Septuagint became their Bible for that time. Uh, when the New Testament writers, well, Jesus read the Bible. Uh, we know he read the Bible in Hebrew. We have the story in Luke 4 of him going to uh, synagogue and unrolling a scroll and reading it. He uh, may have known Greek. He grew up three miles from a Greek-speaking city. Uh, so, uh, but we, we don't know. The early, uh, well, excuse me, what language were the books of the New Testament written in? Greek, all 27 of them. When, and here comes something of the issue, when the New Testament writers read the Old Testament, they and quoted the Old Testament, they quoted the Septuagint Greek. And the Septuagint is different uh, in, differs from the Hebrew in a number of respects. Um, some books are shorter. Jeremiah in particular in the Septuagint is 18% shorter than in the Hebrew. Uh, Psalms is one psalm longer, 151 psalms instead of 150. Daniel is considerably longer. Three whole additional stories, uh, the story of Susanna, the story uh, of... Uh, well, the song of the three young men, you remember the three young men uh, who were in the fire, in, in the fiery furnace? Yes, what were their names? Shadrach and Abednego. Shadrach, my mother used to, when she put me to bed, say, Shadrach, Meshach, and in the bed you go. Uh, <laughs> So I um, they what did they were in the fiery furnace. They get out, they don't burn in the heat. But what did they do while they were in the fiery furnace? Well, in the Septuagint, there's a whole extra section that tells what they did. They sang. And it includes their song. Uh, and it's really quite a nice song. Not in the Hebrew Scriptures, but it's in the Septuagint. Uh, and if it's in the Septuagint, it's in the, that is the Bible that the New Testament writers quoted. Uh, sometimes there are differences of wording, differences of meaning that make the Septuagint um, make, make for New Testament being somewhat uh, 
different from one to the other. And to about the uh, Masoretes and Masoretic text. <clears throat> our, sub <clears throat> our Septuagint manuscripts are uh, the earliest complete Septuagint manuscripts are from whole Bibles. Uh, I think I wrote some of them up there. The we go uh, Codex Vaticanus. 325 A.D., Sinaiticus, 350, Codex Alexandrinus, uh, 400 A.D., as well as many quotations from the Septuagint in the Jewish historian Josephus and in Philo of Alexandria. Uh, they uh, all these, and these, these are big manuscripts containing the whole Bible, New Testament, Old Testament, Old Testament in Greek, including extra parts. Uh, the Septuagint also had some extra books that were not a part of the Hebrew Scripture. Books like uh, Tobit and Sirach and uh, the four books of the Maccabees, books which we now call the Apocrypha, which are Scripture for uh, Orthodox and Catholics, but not for Protestants. So, um, meanwhile, the rabbis, well, as all of this was happening in the first century, the AD, the writing of the New Testament, the rabbis began to uh, revolt against the Septuagint and want to preserve the Hebrew text. It was preserved, although we don't have, uh, well, until 1947, we didn't have any manuscripts from that, uh, from the New Testament period. In the sixth century, um, there arose a group of Jewish scholar rabbis who wanted to preserve the text, the Old Testament text, the Hebrew scriptures, uh, in a clear written form. Problem with Hebrew is there aren't vowels. You've uh, got to do it all with consonants. Uh, the Rabbis might know what this word means, but uh, you know, change a couple of vowels, uh, and things can be the word can have a very different meaning. Vowels can give, oh, for example, a tense. Uh, uh, I'm not going to sit down. I already sat down. Same consonants, sit, sat, but a different meaning because of change in vowels. So this group of scholars, who were known as the Masoretes up there at the top, made a, a Hebrew Bible with, they devised a system of vowels. The vowels are points, dots, and dashes that are uh, below the line in the Hebrew Bible. I'm just going to, you know, I think we and I'll make you do running to pass it around. And when it gets to you, you can. This is uh, this is a Hebrew Bible. Oh, that's that's a uh, had about forty years of service was falling apart, and I had it rebound, and it looks really good now. I think so. Anyway, that's open to a passage we will look at. Let us see. Pass it around and see what a Hebrew Bible looks like. Um, by uh, the ninth century, we were beginning to get some complete Hebrew Bible text that were uh, Masoretic, uh, that had the vowel points. And so we got, well, there are uh, 
four major ones I mentioned there. And one thing uh, I'll mention first, the oldest one probably is Codex Chirensis. Uh, 890, we do have dates on these that were put by the authors. Uh, they uh, were, of course, in Jewish uh, date numbering, but we transfer them now into uh, uh, AD. And you see Codex Chirensis, we found it in Cairo in a storeroom in an old synagogue in Cairo. Mary and I have been in that storeroom. Uh, called the Cairo Geniza, dates to 895 AD. The Aleppo Codex, um, which was dates to about 910, maybe 920, uh, was uh, sad history with it. It was in Aleppo, Syria in 1947, after uh, the Israel became a um, independent nation, there were riots. The synagogue was burned in Aleppo and about three-fourths of the Aleppo Codex uh, was destroyed. Uh, it's now, what's left is now in the uh, uh, Israel Museum, the Shrine of the Book in Jerusalem. Um, the Leningrad Codex, 1008, that one is, all these are Masoretic. That one was complete. And uh, the Hebrew Bible that uh, AJ is seriously reading there is uh, a good copy of the Leningrad Codex uh, with some things that show very, and very little Russian, uh, variation from one of these manuscripts uh, to another. So here's one thing to note. Oh, I, one more I need to tell about. Just so you don't think that I'm totally ancient, I mean, I'm totally ancient, but that my study is totally ancient. New York Times this Thursday, uh, a Bible outlasting Methuselah uh, talks about the code. Well, I said code, that should be Codex. Codex Sassoon, which may be the oldest uh, full Hebrew manuscript we have, uh, bought back in the 1920s from somebody by a uh, German Mr. Sassoon who. Uh, paid about $350 for it. Sotheby's is going to sell it, I think, this week. Uh, if you want to go to New York and put your bid, uh, they're thinking it'll go for about $50 million. Uh, okay. Nobody <laughs> eager to run out the door and get a ticket to New York. Okay, one thing to notice about these dates of these manuscripts. Herensis, Aleppo, Leningrad, so look at those dates, 895. Then look at the dates for the Septuagint manuscripts. They're all a good five centuries early, four at least. Uh, and the, generally speaking, the earlier the manuscript, the more, the closer it is to the original, the more accurate it is. Uh, the <clears throat> problem here is that our earliest manuscripts of the Old Testament weren't Hebrew, but were Greek. Now, uh, when I was in grad school, we were we were taught, yes, that's true, but it's secondary. The Septuagint manuscripts are translations. They're not the original language. They therefore are of relatively little value in terms of 
uh, being giving us an accurate text of the Old Testament. Uh, it's nice if you want to do your own Septuagint studies, but uh, there it was of little use. Well, except to one people, Carl, the uh, Greek Orthodox Church still uses Septuagint as its Old Testament text. So, <clears throat> um, in 1947, and from 1947 until 1956, uh, at a place called Qumran, on the northwest coast of the Dead Sea, uh, about oh, 15 miles, well, less than that, maybe 10 miles from Jerusalem, all downhill. Uh, Dead Sea is the lowest place on earth. There were found over the course of uh, the years 47 to 56, 11 caves that contained uh, Hebrew manuscripts, Hebrew, some Aramaic manuscripts um, They that included manuscripts mostly in fragmentary form, just pieces of the one that had the cave that had the most manuscripts, cave four, had uh, fallen to pieces that just collapsed at some point. And the manuscripts were leather, were leather scrolls, were all shattered into fragments. About 40,000 fragments in K4 alone. Uh, over the next 40 years, scholars would be putting together all the fragments to see what we had. And imagine it's sort of like putting together a 40,000 piece jigsaw puzzle in Hebrew, um, and uh, eventually what we determined was that uh, we had at least pieces of every book of the Old Testament uh, except one, the Book of Esther. And those pieces, the, the uh, text from Qumran were a thousand years older than any Hebrew text of the Bible we had, and also considerably older, four or five centuries older than the uh, than the Septuagint manuscripts that we had. So here we uh, we're on to something. The uh, one. Well, there were a couple of complete scrolls. About 20% of the Dead Sea Scrolls were biblical scrolls. Uh, this one I'm going to pass around is, uh, and it's uh, open to a, the place that we're going to study specifically. Uh, this is the great Isaiah scroll found in Cave 1. It's the entire book of Isaiah with some holes, lacunae we call them. And if I pass that around, uh, do, don't spill coffee on this. This is uh, out of print and rather rare, but you can find it on the internet. Uh, but anyway, the you might notice that you're looking at it. This is pre-Masoretic. It does not have any vowel points. So it's an entirely consonantal text. Uh, so what we found as the fragments and as the larger pieces were studied, some results were surprising. We found uh, that most of the um, manuscripts corresponded quite well to the Masoretic text. But most is not all. Um, in some cases, in some books, the correspondence is much uh, stronger. Uh, for example, in the books of the Torah, the 
uh, Dead Sea Scrolls text and the Masoretic text are very, very close. Uh, get to some other books that's uh, not quite as close. Uh, years ago, I was going to a Society of Biblical Literature meeting uh, where all the biblical scholars get together once a year. And I was, I heard a paper by one of the great uh, scholars, Frank Moore Cross of Harvard, who was one of the original team that uh, put together, deciphered and put together the Dead Sea Scroll fragments, in which he, uh, we had, a, he had, we have a good bit of fragments from uh, the book of 1 Samuel. And, and so this is where you see four Q Sam. Uh, four is K for Kum is Qumran. The Sam is Samuel. Um, these fragments date from about somewhere between 150 and 25 BC. So again, vastly older than any Hebrew we had before. And in that presentation, uh, Professor Cross compared those Samuel fragments with the uh, with the Masoretic text and with the Septuagint. Uh, he picked eight cases in which there was a difference between the Samuel fragments and uh, either uh, either Septuagint or the Masoretic text. Um, in those eight cases where there were differences, five of the eight had the, the Qumran text, the old manuscripts, read not like the Masoretic Hebrew, but had the same reading as the Septuagint. Uh, this was a shock. Septuagint may not be all as bad as we think. Septuagint in this and many other cases, the Septuagint is closer to the ancient Dead Sea Scrolls than, now not in the majority of cases, but in a number of cases, closer to the Dead Sea Scrolls than the Masoretic text is to the Dead Sea Scrolls. So um, the uh, newer translations of the Bible do take into account uh, different Dead Sea Scroll readings. Um, still, and you'll see, if you're reading in your Bible, if you've got an NRSV or an NIV or something like that, uh, if there is a difference in Septuagint, it'll say GK at the bottom and will uh, give you the say, GK for Greek, and we'll give you uh, the Septuagint. Now, all of the New Testament writers wrote in Greek. All of them read the Septuagint as their Old Testament and quoted the Septuagint. So, most cases, it's not much of a difference. But uh, let's see, Nelson, can you go to the next uh, screen? Okay. I'm going to look at one verse. It's an important verse. Isaiah 7, 14. It is quoted by Matthew and uh, Quoted as a prophecy uh, from Isaiah of the virgin birth of Jesus. And uh, I have uh, the first thing at the top of the screen. You see, uh, you see the Septuagint. Diatata do se curios autos you being saving on, and therefore. 
the Lord himself. Um, I usually try to avoid masculine pronouns for God, but reflexive pronouns are a problem sometimes. Uh, so the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin will conceive and bear a son, and you will, the rest of that is, you will call his name Emmanuel. <clears throat> that is Septuagint. That is also what it says in Matthew one twenty three. The Hebrew uh, says the Masoretic text says, uh, and, and I should say this is the same in the uh, Qumran text. Uh, some of that, uh, the Lord Himself will give you a sign. Behold, a young woman has conceived and will bear a son, and you will call his name Emmanuel. A uh, couple of things different. The word virgin is not here. Uh, this word is Alma. Uh, they have a, ver a Hebrew word for virgin, Batula. That's the word Alma, it just means young woman. Different, the further difference is the tense of uh, the next verb that here she has conceived. Uh, she is already pregnant. Past tense, perfect tense in Hebrew, but will bear a son. Uh, the uh, so. This is something that is going on at the time of Isaiah, and it would appear to refer to uh, the birth of King Josiah, uh, right during the time of Isaiah. Now, the Septuagint, which is what Matthew read, has the word, uh, the, the translation is just different. Uh, the word, uh, let's see, about the eighth word there, I can't reach out enough to point it, is Parthenos. Uh, we get the word Parthenon from it. The Parthenon was dedicated to the virgin goddess Athena. Uh, it means virgin. A virgin shall conceive. When Matthew read this verse, he read it in the Septuagint and uh, understood it to be a prophecy of the virgin birth of Jesus. Uh, it would have been quite different had he been reading the uh, uh, Masoretic text. The Masoretic text has been around then. Uh, so, <clears throat> In this instance, this is just a major instance of a, uh, a whole doctrinal matter hinging on the Septuagint. Uh, there are other differences as, as well. That's probably the biggest one. And the case I would like to make with you today is that the Septuagint was the Bible, the Old Testament, of all the New Testament writers, of all the early church fathers, all the Greek church fathers, um, the by, uh, fifth, late 435th century AD, St. Jerome was making a translation into Latin, uh, which became known as the Vulgate Bible, the Bible of the Roman Catholics. The Septuagint remained to this day the translation, the, the Bible of the uh, Eastern Orthodox, or well, Greek Orthodox at least. So what I want to make a case for is that the Septuagint 
is the Christian Old Testament. And that we would do well, at least, there are many English translations of the Septuagint. We might to make it our Old Testament, to have our Bibles that are translations of the Septuagint, like what Peter and Paul read, uh, rather than the Hebrew text. And so, uh, if you go, well, one or two other things point out on uh, this text, you can see the, the vowel points under the text there. And I've got uh, one, more, one more picture. Can you give me that last picture, Nelson? Uh, here we go. Here is that verse in uh, the uh, great Isaiah scroll. And it does, you see, no vowel points. Uh, it does, uh, it, it is the same as the Masoretic text. Uh, you know, which I think of a lot of questions. What, why would the Septuagint translators have changed that Hebrew text from a uh, young woman has conceived and will bear a son to a virgin will conceive and bear a son? Uh, perhaps the Holy Spirit can inspire a new translation. We could call it a bad translation. It's not accurate to what it says, but it becomes a very important translation. And this, then again, is just the, the key. So, again, I'm intending that the Septuagint should be our Old Testament. And let me uh, entertain questions, thoughts, violent disagreements uh, that you may have. So you say the Dead Sea Scrolls predate the Septuagint, correct? Uh, they, well, no, not exactly. Dead Sea Scrolls, the earliest one, and the Isaiah Scroll is uh, very early. It's late, late third century BC, but uh, uh, to, uh, earlier than 200, maybe as early as 250 BC. The Septuagint, um, if we go, go with the story, which I think is basic history, began to be translated about uh, 300 BC. We're talking about uh, Qumran manuscripts. And now we don't have any manuscript in the Septuagint that early. Uh, but yeah, the Septuagint comes, uh, was originally written about the same time that the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, were copied. And let, let me add one other thing. Uh, cave six of the Dead Sea Scrolls contains, everything else is in Hebrew, some in Aramaic. Cave six and a couple of other places contain uh, Septuagint fragments uh, among the Dead Sea Scrolls. They go back, so we know the Septuagint is uh, as old as the Dead Sea Scrolls, at least go. And we know that the last of the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, had to be completed before 68. The Romans destroyed Qumran. So, so yeah, they could be roughly contemporaneous. Now, you take uh, the other hand, the book of Isaiah itself, uh, there are probably three distinct writers at different times, but this one would be the uh, first Isaiah. He's writing around 720. BC, so about five centuries earlier. And so uh, did that did I just completely confuse the matter more or uh, I'll just cut and dry this as, as people. 
Yeah, I mean, you got you know you got two situations. When something was originally written, when is our earliest copy, and uh, when was it translated to Greek, and when's our earliest copy of that Greek translation? So those four things kind of balance out. Uh, I don't know, does that make it any clearer for <laughs> you? Is it worth adding to the murkiness by, I'm assuming the, the dating of the Dead Sea Scrolls you refer to is by, uh, I'm forgetting the correct term, the calligraphy, the style of writing is much or more than any... Uh, paleography is the, the term. Uh, and that's been the main thing for dating. But uh, since we had radioactive carbon dating back at the time of the Dead Sea Scrolls, but it has uh, techniques of radioactive carbon dating have improved enormously. Uh, all organic material contains carbon. A small percentage of that carbon, carbon-14 is radioactive. It, uh, which means that it uh, diminishes over a stated period of time, half-life of about 50,000 years. So what we have been able to do is uh, to take some small pieces off the scrolls that, I would say, um, just for example, piece down here that didn't have any writing on it and radioactive carbon dating dated. We can date now uh, within 25 years either way, 50 year span. And all of, uh, oh, and there were controversies when the scroll that they were all, uh, some scholars lost their reputations claiming that the scrolls were fakes. Uh, well, they weren't, we radioactive dated carb, uh, carbon dated um, number of scroll fragments and they all go back to the to that period third century BC to first century AD. Now, uh, so they are authentic to that time. Uh, there are yes yeah, so other thoughts, questions, clarities. Hmm. Not directly related to that, but uh, something you said earlier that, that at a certain time, most Jews did not speak Hebrew. They spoke Greek. Right. Were, were the services, were they ever the readings in, in synagogue in Greek, or <coughs> they sat and listened to a language they didn't know? Uh, like a Latin rap? <laughs> synagogue's a good word. Know what language the word synagogue is? That's Greek. It's Greek. Gathering soon, get to uh, and soon, and uh, aggregate, I guess, will be get together. The place where you get together. It's a Greek word. It's not a Hebrew word. Uh, there were synagogues, uh, doubtless, well, here's the difference, and it's a, the same in uh, Jewish synagogues to this day. You read when you read from the Torah, uh, you read the Hebrew. Even if people don't understand the Hebrew, that's what you read. When uh, the preacher preaches, uh, when any sort of liturgy is going on. That's going to be in the language of the people, in our case, English. Uh, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Ken? Just curious about a Jewish scholarship on the question that you're raising now and if it's ongoing in regard to their use of the Septuagint. Uh, in the late first century, a, a group of rabbis. After the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans, a group of rabbis under the leadership of Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai assembled 
at a uh, place on the coast. Jerusalem was destroyed, um, and Yavada was the place on the coast, and formed something like a council where they, in a sense, rewrote Judaism. There was no temple anymore. Uh, so much of Jewish life and worship revolved around the temple. It was going to cease to revolve around the temple and begin to revolve around the writings. Uh, and most prominent among those writings were the Torah and then the other uh, Hebrew scriptures. They rejected uh, Greek as a language that they would use in worship. And uh, they went with Hebrew. Uh, Christians went with Greek. Now, I've got time for uh, a couple of more questions. Does the uh, <clears throat> Septuagint maintain the different names for the deity? Um, that kind of started source criticism off like in Genesis with um, Yahweh and Elohim and um, how is that reflected in the Septuagint? Uh, in the Septuagint, <clears throat> uh, the word, and I don't have a word, I can't write it, the word for God, which would be the word for Elohim, is theos. Uh, Theos, we get our words theology uh, from that. The word for Lord is kurios, uh, and you may know the uh, liturgical, the Kyrie eleison, uh, which means Lord have mercy. Uh, so they, those words will be used uh, to translate. Um, Kurios to translate uh, uh, the word Yahweh uh, and Theos to translate uh, the word Elohim. Okay. Oh, okay. I have a question, but just to go along with what you're saying, 25 years ago when I had to take biblical perspectives at the Christian university where I was, my a uh, professor agreed with you. It was like the only manuscript he talked about with the Septuagint. So, well, thank you for that. <laughs> well, at least there are two of us in, in the world. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, well, uh, what, uh, you know, I would like to see at least, and that, not that we should, I'm, I'm always for more possibilities, um, not that we should replace the Hebrew scriptures with the Septuagint, but we ought to make some Bibles with the Old Testament as they are in our most ancient Bibles and Codex uh, Sinaiticus, Vaticanus, Alexandrinus, Ephraimi, the rest of them that used uh, their translations of the Septuagint. And that would include, maybe I'll close you with this one last thought, uh, would include uh, Septuagint things that aren't in the uh, uh, Hebrew Bible. In cave 11, we discovered a psalm scroll in Hebrew. And it's the, you know, by a thousand, more than a thousand years, the oldest Hebrew manuscript we have of the psalms. Uh, and guess what was in there in Hebrew? That was not in any Masoretic text. Psalm 151. Just like the Septuagint, uh, but in Hebrew. And Psalm 151 
I mean, it really needs to be in our Bible. It's not a big, great psalm, but it's, uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we might uh, we give that a try. Well, uh, thank you. Hope this wasn't... Uh... One, one, one oh, question. go ahead. When the, the 70, we'll say, came back with probably 70 uh, slightly differing translations, who... Who narrowed that down into this is the Septuagint? Um, we don't know. We don't even, the whole 70 thing may be legend. Uh, it's, in, it's in a book uh, from about um, that time period, second century BC, maybe third, uh, called the Letter of Aristias that gives the whole story of the making of the Septuagint. Uh, and of course, they did. They did like miracle stories, and yes. uh, that was one. That that was a story, actually. <clears throat> that I'll call it a legend. Uh, it's not taught as this is <laughs> biblical truth, but the story is that Simeon, the old man in the temple who held uh -huh. Jesus, was one of the seventy. If you're adding up the math. That doesn't work. He'd be really old. Yeah. Huh. The the reason the, the background to that is that he was writing a young girl will conceive when he came to that word, and an angel told him, No, change it a virgin, and you will live to see that day. So 300, 400 years later, and I have never heard that. Who, who knows what? Yeah. But I always wondered because uh, you you hear you read the story and he says almost as soon as he's holding the baby, now let me depart in peace. Yeah, huh. kind of an odd reading, but it's like okay, I've I've seen it now. I I did my time. <laughs> now let me oh, depart in peace. A good story. It's what a good story. What I'm passing around, what I forgot to pass around earlier, that's a Septuagint. It's really two, uh, that's the second volume of that Septuagint, but it's turned to uh, the place that has Isaiah 714. And uh, so, well, thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, I'll, uh, the quiz is next week. <laughs> all, all the terms must be remembered. Uh, okay. But uh, uh, God be with you as we go and let us go worship the Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Speaking of next week.